The matter was very disturbing to Abraham on account of his son. Why, as he paused to think about it a moment, it practically made him sick to his stomach. He hadn't been able to sleep all night long thinking about it. And early in the morning, while it was still dark, he finally gave up even trying, and he got out of bed. He went to the kitchen tent. The servants were already there, as they were supposed to be, already hard at work baking the day's bread. He grabbed the first loaf to come out of the oven. It was warm and had a firm crust. It was made with the better flour, the flour that was normally reserved for him and for Sarah and their honored guests. But he thought perhaps this time he could make an exception. He thrust the bread into the bag and he took a water skin, a good one, one that would not leak and he went to fill it from the well. Abraham's African slaves lived in a group of tents separate from the main camp. He did not finish this neighbor. He did not visit this neighborhood often. And as he walked now among the tents, he could not help but notice that many of them were shabby. The skins were patched. No doubt they were leaky. They certainly had a bad smell. It was very distressing to Abraham to think that these poor slaves of his had to live in these hand-me-down tents, tents that people like him had finished with. It was maddening, but that was how things were. He found the tent of Hagar, the Egyptian, the mother of his son Ishmael, and he called out to her softly. She was very surprised to see him come to her door. It was distressing to Abraham to think of how little time he had ever spent with her, how little he knew her. But there was no time for that now. He told her that the decision had been made and that she and her son would both have to leave. They would go out into the wastelands of Beersheba and could take nothing with them to sustain him but the bread and the water he had brought. This is all very distressing to me on account of my son, Abraham said, but I'm afraid there is no choice. It's just the way it has to be. Hagar, surprisingly, had little sympathy for Abraham's distress. She was selfishly far more concerned with questions about how she and Ishmael might survive the terrible journey that was being forced upon them. Ah, but again, has, hadn't it always been so with Hagar? Even back when she had been sent to Abraham by her mistress, she had hardly be concerned at all with the suffering that Sarah had gone through, her anguish at not being able to have a child. She hadn't even been concerned with the urgent matter of supplying Abraham with a son who would be his heir. No, instead she got all worked up about how Abraham was raping her. The whole incident had been very distressing to Abraham, but it had been unavoidable. It was just what you did when your wife couldn't have a child for you and there was a lovely slave girl available. I mean, <laughs> what was he supposed to do? Allow Hagar to have control over her own body? <laughs> what would be next? Uh, she would want to be able to claim Ishmael as her own son. Why, if something like that started to happen, before you knew it, the very foundations of society would begin to collapse. The economy would crater out of the fear and insecurity as people who didn't know their place began to demand change. Abraham shuddered at the very thought. As he'd lain awake, tossing and turning in his bed the night before. Abraham had turned the question over and over in his head. 
He couldn't help but wonder, was he doing the right thing? He was supposed to be different from other people. Yahweh, the Lord, blessed be his name, had chosen Abraham, had specially set him apart from all other people, all other tribes who surrounded him. God would build a great nation out of him. That was the promise. And yes, it was true that that promise was to be fulfilled through his new son, through Isaac, not through Ishmael. But was it auspicious to begin a new nation by sending Hagar and the boy out into the desert with nothing but a water skin and a bag of bread? Did the supremacy of one nation need to be built upon the repression of another? Something, something seemed wrong with that, and Abraham had wrestled with it all night long. Was it truly what Yahweh wanted? But just before he had risen, Abraham had made peace with the idea. Had not God made a promise to him? And surely that promise extended also to Ishmael. And so God would take care of the boy. So Abraham didn't have to. He could just take care of the water skin and the bread. It was the least he could do. <sighs> yes, Abraham could do the least and leave the rest up to God. Yahweh surely didn't want Abraham to stay dist distressed. Did he? The wilderness of Beersheba was desolate in those days. There were no settlements. Nomadic peoples were few and far between. And Hagar and Ishmael had no real direction in which to go. They stumbled onwards. They stumbled towards the south. They saw not one human being all day long. And the scattered wildlife stayed far away. Ishmael was 14 at that time. He was old enough to understand just how dire their situation was. He watched carefully as the bread in the bag grew less and less, and he watched with great alarm as the water in the skin grew less and less. But most of all, his eyes turned towards his mother. Obviously, she was concerned with the challenge that they were facing, but he could not see on her face the terror that he expected to find there. He took comfort from that, but, but still he was puzzled. Finally, he had to ask, Mother, what do you know that I don't know? Why are you not afraid that we are facing this enormous challenge? Hagar had told her boy very little of her own story. She had not told him about how Abraham had become his father. She had known how it would have disturbed him, how it might have estranged him from the father that she had hoped might give him a better inheritance than a bag of bread and a skin of water. But now, now that didn't really seem to matter all that much. As they walked on, she began to tell him the whole story of the worst night of her life and how she had felt powerless in the bed of that vile old man. But honestly, she did not dwell on that part of the story because that part of the story did not explain the hope she now carried within her. She focused instead on something that had happened afterwards. Once she had conceived, once Ishmael had started to grow within her, Sarah, her mistress, had been jealous because Hagar had done what Sarah had not been able to do. In her wrath, Sarah became so cruel towards Hagar that she felt as if she had no choice but 
that she had to run away. That time she had not been able to take anything with her, not even a bag of bread and a skin of water. She had been terrified that she would die. She had wandered until her hunger and her thirst made her begin to see things. <sighs> ah, but what she had seen. For in the midst of her delirium, she saw Yahweh, the God of Abraham, of all gods. Except he wasn't like the God that Ab had always talked about. See, God, when Abraham spoke of him, had only been concerned with how many cattle, how many goats Abraham had, and, of course, whether he would have a son. But when Hagar saw Yahweh, she noticed something very different. She saw a God who saw her, who saw her anguish, who saw her pain, who saw what she suffered, and who loved her. And on that day, Yahweh spoke to her and promised her that she would have a son and that he would become a great nation. And it was a promise for her, not for Abraham. And in return for all of that, Hagar named the God that she met in the desert. She called him El Royi, the God who sees. And on the strength of that vision, Hagar was able to return. She went back to her mistress to find that Sarah had repented at least somewhat of her cruelty. Hagar told Ishmael that the reason why she was not afraid now was because she knew that El Royi was still her God and was a God who saw the powerless and the persecuted, and knowing that she was seen, that was enough. The water skin ran out the next day. Hagar squeezed the last few drops into her son's mouth. When he looked up at her imploringly, she could only shake her head. Ishmael didn't say anything. There was nothing to be said. He wandered off to find the shade of some bush. He lay down and went to sleep. If something didn't happen soon, he might not wake up. Hagar had given more water to the boy than she had taken for herself, and so she was in a worse state. Already she could feel the delirium coming upon her, a familiar delirium, like when she had fled 14 years ago. But instead of seeing that as a reason to despair this time, she felt it was a sign of hope. She saw this strange light flash on the edge of her vision. She turned towards it, followed it, and it led her on. She followed it for several steps until the light shifted and came to rest on a flat rock that lay on the floor of the desert. It was just a rock. It did not look any different from any of the other rocks that surrounded it. But the flashing light remained on it, rested on it. It did not shift. And Hagar fell to her knees before that rock. And with the last of her failing strength, she pushed against it. To her surprise, it shifted a little bit. There was a cavity underneath. She detected a dampness, a smell of water. Hagar called out to her son. The chances of stumbling upon a well dug in the desert, hidden 
under a rock by a band of nomads. The chances are infinitesimal. This was no accident. Hagar knew that God, her God, el had seen her again. Hagar and Ishmael drank. They filled the skin. They lived, walked on, continued to wander deeper and deeper into the wilderness. And they lived there. And as, as, as Ishmael grew and came into his full strength and maturity, he did well. He went on to become the father of a great nation. And as for Abraham, well, did I mention that he felt really distressed about the whole affair. Hagar is this fascinating character in the Bible. She's totally powerless. She's a woman and a slave who is impregnated without anyone even thinking to ask her what she thought about the matter. Yet, she is one of the few women in the Bible to receive a promise directly from God and indeed the only woman given the incredible honor of giving a name to God. But actually, I don't really think that I've told the story of Hagar in this sermon. Other people, uh, other uh, women in particular, have told her story much better than I ever could. Now, I didn't set out to tell her story. I set out to tell the story of the one in the passage that I could identify with most, and that with most, and with whom most of the people I know could also identify. I set out to tell the story of the person who had privilege, who had been given everything, every opportunity to find and build control over his own life, and who was blessed because of the way that society was structured. I set out to tell the story of the person who is distressed when he noticed all the ways in which certain people live out under systemic injustice and disadvantage, and yet who feels powerless to do anything to change the system. I set out to tell the story from Abraham's point of view, which is, let's be honest, pretty much the view of the Bible. But even if the Bible does take the point of view of the privileged and the chosen one so often, there is much in this story that should point out to us that our distress for how things are is simply not enough. And the God that we are coming to know as various people in the world today who have suffered under systemic injustice stand up and demand change, that God has something to say to us. That God is on the side of the poor and the forgotten on the, and the outcast, but not just so that we can feel better in our distress for how things are. This story needs to push ourselves to ask more of ourselves than that we feel a little bit of distress.